Shipwrecks of the American Thousand Islands of the St. Lawrence River In the Thousand Islands, there are more shipwrecks per square mile or kilometer than any other location in the Great Lakes. The purpose of this presentation is to provide a basic understanding of this unique collection of shipwrecks in the American waters of the Thousand Islands. All shipwrecks have owners, and regulations that govern them. Shipwrecks that are over 50 years are considered historic. You need a permit from the State Museum to conduct archaeological research on state land including shipwreck sites on state submerged lands. Scuba divers can visit, photograph and dive on shipwrecks but they cannot disturb them. Laws governing shipwrecks are beyond the scope of this presentation. From Tibbetts Point to Dark Island, there are about 20 known shipwrecks on the U.S. side of the Thousand Islands. These wrecks are indicated with blue markers. The earliest navigation route to the interior of North America passed through the Thousand Islands. Today it is known as the St. Lawrence Seaway. Shipwrecks in it include the oldest identifiable shipwreck of any vessel that sailed on the Great Lakes and the last significant major shipwreck that is diveable. Shipwrecks have always been important to the communities in the Thousand Islands, besides just places to scuba dive, shipwrecks currently play an important role in tourism. Most museums have shipwreck programs or displays. Several of the tour boat lines have shipwreck tours. The largest shipwreck event is Pirate Days in Alexandria Bay which celebrates the 1838 capture and sinking of the British steamship Sir Robert Peel. The top book in this slide, Diver's Guide to the Upper St. Lawrence River, was written in 1993 by Don Martin of Brockville, Ontario and Skip Couch of Clayton, New York. They were some of the first scuba divers in the Thousand Islands. Skip started diving in 1959. In their Diver's Guide, they documented 71 U.S. and Canadian shipwrecks from Tibbetts Point to the locks near Messina. All but a few of the currently known wrecks were listed in their book 27 years ago. Diver's Guide to the Upper St. Lawrence River is out of print. In 2010 Skip Couch and Dennis McCarthy published Shipwrecks of the Thousand Islands and Dive the Thousand Islands with updated shipwreck information. This is a view from the Thousand Islands Bridge. The dashed red lines indicate the main navigation channel. To understand the significance of shipwrecks to the navigation channels the next slide adds shipwrecks. The majority of the shipwrecks in the Thousand Islands are under or near the seaway. This clustering of shipwrecks near each other and close to shore is a major factor in the success of dive charters and dive tourism. Starting in the late 1800s, hard hat divers were used in salvaging shipwrecks, recovering bodies and even in some cases treasure hunting. With the availability of low-cost scuba equipment starting about 1960, most shipwrecks in less than 140 feet of water were located. Technical divers in the last few years using mixed gases and rebreathers can now access wrecks in the deepest part of the Thousand Islands. An example is the speedboat Giggles that in 1929 collided with the tour boat Thousand Islander. The Giggles sank immediately in 200 feet of water. The depth of water was deeper than hard hat divers could safely dive to. This became a spectator event when it was decided to use 2,000 sticks of dynamite to open the hull of the boat and recover the bodies. With the location known and the technology now to dive at these depths, the blown apart remains of the giggles may be found. This is an 1890 photo of hard hat divers recovering bodies from the Catherine, a small steam-powered yacht that sunk after a collision with the steamer St. Lawrence. In the picture a barge is visible in the upper right corner with two men handling airlines and a compressor. Hard hat divers ripped open the wreck to recover the bodies of the passengers. The 1890 photo from a collection at the Shipyard Museum in Clayton was labeled Raising the Dead from the Catherine. When it was viewed by members of the Clayton Diving Club, they realized that a cottage behind a shoal in the river still existed on Manhattan Island just below Alex Bay. By recreating the location the picture was taken from, they found the wreck in the 1970s.
Many of the shipwrecks started out as groundings on the shoals and rock ledges that line the navigation channels. This is a picture of the Oconto that ran aground on Granite State Shoal in 1886. Next to it are a tug and schooner that were used in recovering as much cargo as possible. Eventually the Oconto slid into deep water and its salvage was continued by hardhat divers. Not all shipwrecks stayed on the bottom. A large number of the shipwrecks in the Thousand Islands were raised within a year of their sinking. This is a picture of the steamer Islander being raised soon after she sunk in Alexandria Bay. Once raised, she was salvaged and the hull was moved and sunk in deeper water where it still rests today. In many cases, the wrecks were refitted and put back in service. Most of the shipwrecks in the Thousand Islands are not of national historic interest. Some are only piles of wreckage and others are vessels that were abandoned when they were no longer needed. Some Thousand Islands shipwrecks are of historical significance. Iroquois was a warship built by the French in 1759 near modern-day Prescott, Ontario. In 1760 she was captured by the British and renamed the Anson. The following year she was lost on present-day Niagara Shoal. Haldeman was a British warship launched in 1771 near present-day Ogdensburg, New York. Unfit for service in 1782, she was abandoned in North Bay Carleton Island, where her remains still lie today. The steamship Sir Robert Peel was burned and sunk in 1838 as revenge for the British burning of the American vessel the Caroline near Niagara Falls. Her hull rests center channel upstream from the Thousand Islands Bridge. The Roquois and Haldeman predate the United States and all three predate Canada. Each of these vessels sailed under the flag of Great Britain when sunk. The following slides are some of the premier shipwrecks of the U.S. side of the Thousand Islands. On August 17, 1889, the three-masted wooden schooner A.E. Vickery struck the shoal above Rock Island Lighthouse while entering the American Narrows. She had a cargo of 21,000 bushels of corn destined for Weiser's Distillery at Prescott, Ontario. Launched July 1861 at Three Mile Bay, New York as the J.B. Penfield and renamed the A.E. Vickery on February 25, 1884. The captain of the Vickery employed a pilot to navigate her through the American Narrows from Rock Island Light to Alexandria Bay. When the Vickery struck and went aground the captain threatened the pilot with a revolver. The mate, the captain's brother, grabbed the captain's arm, discharging the revolver and sending the bullet into the deck. The revolver fell and was picked up by the mate and thrown overboard. The pilot made himself scarce and the revolver has never been found. This is a satellite view looking down on the side of the Vickery shipwreck. A side scan image of the wreck has been placed into the image to show the location of the shipwreck. The two boats in the picture are dive boats on the access mooring. The bow of Vickery is resting at the bottom of a 60-foot vertical rock wall. The hull runs at an angle from the wall down to a depth of 110 feet. On the deck at the bow is the windlass, cat heads and tow bit post. An anchor chain is draped over the side. The large ship rails run down past the holds and the mast stumps to the stern over where the rudder is located at 110 feet. The masts lie nearby and continue off into the channel at about 155 feet deep where there are strong currents. This is a view of the bits near where the catheads that would have supported the anchors. Her anchors were removed in 1959 when scuba divers first found the wreck. Still on the forecastle is the massive windlass of the Vickery. This was a machine with a horizontal rotating barrel used to pull anchor ropes or chains. The stern of the Vickery at a depth of 110 feet hangs out over a ledge of rocks. Her broken masts run down to 180 feet. Launch in 1889 at Picton, Ontario, 
The wooden schooner the Maggie L was one of the last commercial sailing vessels on the Great Lakes and Upper St. Lawrence River. She sunk in a collision with the steel freighter Key State on November 4, 1929. The Maggie L rests between Governor's Islands and the village of Clayton, its bow was cut off during its collision with the steamer Key State. It is in about 60 to 70 feet of water. In 2019 the Clayton Dive Club videoed the Maggie L and using a process called photogrammetry produced a 3D model of the shipwreck. The damage from the 1929 collision is very obvious even after 90 years. The masts were cut off to about 3 feet above the deck. Wooden cleats are still visible just below where the masts were cut. The ship's rudder is still intact. The Maggie L was sunk only 45 years when it was found in the early 1970s. Sport scuba diving at the time, like the hard hat diving before it, was primarily involved in salvaging. Before the arrival of the zebra mussel, underwater photography was almost impossible. Like many wrecks from that time, many of its artifacts were salvaged. Not many shipwrecks come with names. The Maggie L is unique as its name is still on the stern of the transom, where it is covered with zebra mussels. The Sidewell Steamer Islander was launched in Rochester, New York in 1871 as the James H. Kelly. It operated as a mail carrier and tour boat. In 1909 she burned and sank at a dock in Alexandria Bay. The hull was raised and salvaged and re-sunk out of the way of navigation. The wreck site is just offshore at the foot of Market Street near Cornwell Brothers Store and Museum. The wooded hull rests on the slope of the bottom. It is close to being parallel with the shore and is at a depth of 20 to 60 feet. Islander Shipwreck is one of the most visited dive sites in the Thousand Islands. It even has its own Facebook page with 250 followers. Signage at the site tells the story of the island at. Car parking and water access are available. The site is used by many dive instructors for open water training. An underwater dive platform is located nearby as well as an underwater cafe of chairs and tables that have been discarded into the river in past years. In this picture, a diver can be seen looking into one of the large lockers where the paddle wheels were located before salvage. On June 20, 1932, the steel drillboat America sunk due to an explosion. She was in the process of widening the channel near Dark Island when upwards of a ton and a half of dynamite exploded killing seven of the ten-man crew. America is under the seaway between Dark Island and Buoy 167. Divers can follow an old chain on the bottom from outside the channel that leads to the wreck. The site is not recommended for sport scuba diving. The upside down hull can be accessed by divers. They need to avoid the oil that is everywhere around and under the wreck. The oil was on board when the ship flipped. It is now covered by a thin layer of silt. On the wreck's exposed bottom are its twin props and small rudders and the four spud or retractable legs. The spuds were large iron beams with feet that were lowered onto the bottom to hold the boat in place and stabilize her while drilling. St. Louis was built in 1864 by Peck and Masters in Cleveland, Ohio. She was originally configured with two decks, one mast, and listed to have a single screw propeller. From 1864 to 1906 she was used in commerce on the Great Lakes. In 1914 she was abandoned in Cape Vincent as a total loss. Her final resting place was along an old pier on the down channel side of Cape Vincent's East End Park.
This is a satellite view looking down on East End Park in the village of Cape Vincent. The side scan image of the wreck has been added to the picture to show the location of the shipwreck. In 8 to 20 feet of water, the wreck is not visible from the park shore. The St. Louis wreck is a popular training site. The combination of good shore access and protected space make it one of the most visited wreck sites in the Thousand Islands. Only the lowest part of its frames and hull remains. Next to the wreck is an old submerged rockfield dock. Several yards behind the wreck on the channel side is a very large rudder. Large wooded timbers run the length of the hull. These large timbers give an indication of the heavy cargo she could carry. The Cape Vincent Dive Club monitors the wreck site of St. Louis. The club raised funds for an informational panel about the wreck which has been donated to the village of Cape Vincent to be installed in the spring of 2021. Roy A. Jodry a 640-foot self-loader freighter built in 1965. It sank in 1974 off of the Coast Guard Station in Alexandria Bay. It is considered a world-class dive site. Many divers refer to it as the Mount Everest of diving because of the depth and conditions. On Wednesday, November 20, 1974, the Roya Jodry was upbound on the St. Lawrence River near Alexandria Bay, New York. She ran out of the channel and struck Pullman Shoal. The captain decided to beach his ship next to the U.S. Coast Guard station on Wellesley Island. That night around 3 a.m., the ship sank to the river bottom. For many years the Jodry was off-limits to scuba divers. This was because of the leaking oil from the hull in the 1990s. By 2004 the oil from the Jodry was effectively removed and she has been cleared for diving only by the most experienced technical divers. The smokestack with the Algoma Central Railway markings is still visible. Technical diver on the bridge of the Jodry. Built in 1872, the Oconto was a propeller of 500 tons burden. She had accommodations for 100 first-class cabin passengers. Oconto struck Granite State Shoal July 10, 1886, and sank. This was her first trip through the lakes to Ogdensburg and return. She left Ogdensburg with a valuable cargo of silks, cotton and boots, and shoes valued at $500,000. On board there was a crew of 38 men and 15 passengers, all of whom were taken off safely. Granite State Shoal is in the American Narrows of the Seaway. Oconto was grounded on the shoal and her cargo was being removed when she suddenly slid back off the shoal into the channel to the deep water of 140 to 180 feet. The remains of the Oconto are across the channel from Rock Island Light. She lying under the shipping channel. There is an extremely strong current. Broken in two, the wreck partially rests on itself. There were several attempts to salvage her valuable cargo. All ended in failure and most like resulting in the massive destruction of the vessel. Diving on the Oconto is extreme and only suitable for highly trained tech divers. Tech divers use special gas mixtures for breathing and can dive in the range of 130 to 350 feet. Many tech divers say there is more than one wreck on Granite State Shoal where the wreck of the Oconto lies. Some of the wreckage is right side up and some are upside down. Much is a pile of timber that is indistinguishable as a ship. The Oconto ran onto the shoal bow first while traveling upstream. The shoal is so steep that there were over 100 feet of water at the stern. The propeller on the wreck is damaged as if it hit the shoal.
The Thousand Island Museum has a model of the steamboat Fanny that sank off Granite State Shoal in the late 1800s. The model was made by Charles Roof, born in 1866. When he was 16 years old he was an eyewitness of its sinking. Some of the wreckage that is supposed to be the Oconto has a close resemblance to the model of the Fanny. The Keystorm, built about 1908 in Wellsend, England was carrying a cargo of 2,230 tons of bituminous coal from the Genesee Dock at Charlotte, New York, under command of Captain L. Day Galt. While approaching Dark Island, she struck out her Scow Island Shoal on October 12, 1912. This is a side-scan image of the Keystorm as she now rests on outer Scow Island Shoal. A side-scan image is produced by a sonar device that emits narrow pulses of sound down toward the bottom from a hull or tow fish transducer. The device records any reflected back sound. The return echoes can be plotted like lines on a printer to produce an image of what is on the bottom. This image was taken by a consumer-grade unit that can be found on many of the boats in the Thousand Islands. Several attempts were made by wrecking companies using hardhat divers to salvage her but they all failed. The ship's wheel was recovered in the early 1960s and until about 2004 it was on display at the marine store at Shermerhern Landing. Things to see on the wreck are its large prop, funnels, engine room, masts, anchor chain. The 256-foot-long wreck rests from a depth from 20 feet to 120 feet. It is dived on from beginner to experienced scuba divers. The Keystorm is in U.S. waters, it rests close to the Canadian border. Known as the crown jewel of sport diving in the Thousand Islands, divers from each country have been known to plant their flags on the wreck. This concludes the St. Lawrence River Historical Foundation's presentation, Shipwrecks of the American Thousand Islands. For more information visit www.srhf.info.